Welcome to our study. We're continuing with Job chapter 21, finishing up the chapter with verses 17 to 34. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Job 21 and let's begin. Verse 17 to 21, Job makes the point to his friends that the wicked sometimes suffer, but not all the time. Verse 17, how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them? The sorrows God distributes in his anger. Earlier, Bildad told Job how the life of the wicked is extinguished and how the life of his life of prosperity will not continue. Job 18, 5 to 6. The light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent, and his lamp beside him is put out. Now, Job responds by saying, how often? First, how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? Second, how often does the destruction of the wicked come upon them? Third, how often does God, in his anger, distribute sorrows to the wicked? Job makes the point that while the wicked sometimes suffers in this life, they do not always suffer for wickedness. The point the friends were making is that the wicked suffer. And they insinuated that because Job suffered, he was wicked. However, it was not true. Verse 18. They are like straw before the wind, and like chaff that a storm carries away. Job expresses the position of his friends that the wicked are punished being like straw, that is blown by the wind or like the chaff that a storm carries away. The psalmist contrasted the godly with the ungodly in Psalm 1-4. He said, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. However, Job asks in this passage in Job 21-18, how often? If such happened often, would David need to plead with the Lord to take action against his enemies? No. Psalm 35 and 5, let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Verse 19, they say, God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him that he may know it. According to Job, his friends rationalize any delay in punishment of the wicked. God lays up the iniquity of the wicked for his children. That is, God stores up the punishment for the iniquity of the wicked instead of for him, for his children. Perhaps the wicked man is not punished because God plans to punish the children or of the wicked for his iniquity. Now, Job recoils at that thought. He calls for God to recompense or to give the wicked man his due in this life. This way, he may personally know or experience his own punishment. If his children sin, they should be punished for their sin. While the children may experience consequences for the sin of their father, they should not be punished for the father's sin. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The word recompense may also mean to repay. Let God 
repay the wicked man that he may know it, Job says. So Job, the friends point out that that uh, man suffers because of his sin. And then Job points out that sometimes the wicked prosper. Yes, the wicked sometimes suffer, but sometimes they prosper. But the friends point out, well, perhaps the wicked man's not prospering now because God lays up his iniquity for his children. And Job makes the point of his friends, and then he comes back at it and says, let God recompense him that the wicked man may know himself. Verse 20, let his eyes see his destruction and let him drink the wrath of the Almighty. Job calls for the eyes of the wicked to see his destruction. The part, the eyes, of the man is put for the whole. The part for the whole, the eyes for the man. So let the eyes of the wicked see his destruction. Or let the wicked man see his destruction. In the second part of the passage, Job calls for the wicked man to drink the wrath of the Almighty. So you see the poetic language of of this passage in Job. Drink the wrath. The psalmist Asaph in Psalm 75, 8 wrote of a cup of wrath in the hand of the Lord that he pours out for the wicked to drink like wine. Psalm 75, 8, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red. It is fully mixed and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. So the psalmist paints the picture of the, of the wrath of God as though it was wine in a cup, and he gave it to the, the wicked to drink down. Here, Job says, let the wicked man drink of the wrath of the Almighty. So basically, let him experience God's wrath. Verse 21. For what does he care about his household after him when the number of his months is cut in half? Job speaks of how the wicked man who is selfish does not care about his household who will live after him after he is gone. So he speaks generally of the wicked. He says, the number of his months is cut in half. Earlier, Job said that the number of the months of man is with God. Job 14, 5, it says, since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so he cannot pass. And so the, according to Job 14, 5, the number of his months, the months of Man, man's life is with the Lord, it belongs to him. So he pointed out man's days are determined and that God has appointed the limits for a man. So here he talks about the number of his months being cut in half. And so his life being cut off, cut short, premature. Now, in verses 22 to 26, Job makes the point that death comes to all. It's not just the wicked. It's everyone. Verse 22. Can anyone teach God knowledge since he judges those on high? No one can teach God knowledge. As said by the psalmist in Psalm 147 in verse 5, his understanding is infinite. You cannot teach God anything. Job implies that his mortal friends attempted to teach God. It was as though they were telling God how he should act towards man. God who dwells on high judges those on high. Who are those on high? Well, this may refer to God's angels. Read about uh, God's saints, God's angels 
Job 4 and 18, and Job 15 and 15. No mortal man can teach God knowledge since God judges even the angels, his servants. Verse 23. One dies in his full strength, being wholly at ease and secure. Here in verse 23, Job begins to make a comparison between two mortal men. First, Job says that one man dies in full strength. Even though he is physically strong, full of vigor, comfortable and secure, he still dies. Earlier, Job said in Job, 15, Job 16 and 12, I was at ease, but he, God, has shattered me. Job had thought, thinks at this time, that, and in Job 16 and 12, that God had brought this upon him. He was wrong. Um, but Job said, I was at ease, but he has shattered me. And so Job, of course, speaks from what he, he thinks is his experience. Prior to his affliction, he was at ease and secure, peaceful and living in quietness. So Job points out that there's one man, you know, he's full, he's at full strength, full of vigor. He's at ease and secure. He lives in quietness. Verse 24. His pails are full of milk, and the marrow of his bones is moist. Job describes the man who dies in full strength in verse 23, and now in 24, he gives a couple figures for prosperity and strength. First, his pails are full of milk. This is a figure of prosperity. Uh, for example, his pails or his buckets being full of milk. The idea of being plenty of milk or fatness, cream. And so these, these expressions of prosperity. Zophar said that the wicked would not see prosperity. He used the figures of honey and cream for, for prospering in this life. Job 20 and 17, the wicked, he will not see the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and cream. Job 20 and 17. But here Job points out that there's the one man, he's full strength and vigor, at ease and secure, he has plenty, prosperous, verse 24. Second, the marrow of his bones is moist. What does this mean? Well, the same term is translated both strength and bones. Of course, one can understand bones representing strength. Bones providing strength, the framework of the body. Uh, here's a picture of vigor, of strength. His pails are full of milk, his prosperity, and the marrow of his bones is moist, his strength, his vigor. For example, in Proverbs 3 and 8, he speaks of wisdom, and he says, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. That word strength is, is, is a word meaning to drink, uh, like marrow to your bones. Uh, strength to your bones, and so again, a figure of strength and wisdom. Of course, in our passage here in Job, we see prosperity and strength, verse 24. Now, that's one man that Job describes. So you have one man who's very strong and prosperous. Verse 25, another man dies in the bitterness of his soul, never having eaten with pleasure. And so Job describes a second man. And the second man, he says, dies in the bitterness of his soul. This refers to the misery or the anguish that he experiences before death. He died in misery without ever enjoying the pleasures of life, whether tasting food or literally 
or metaphorically tasting of prosperity or experiencing prosperity in life. He dies without ever having known it. So two different men are pointed out here by Job. More about the bitterness of soul, the soul. Earlier, Job spoke of himself who suffered in misery as the bitter of soul, Job 3 and 20. He also said how he would not restrain his mouth. He would not remain silent. He said, I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. And Job said, I will complain in the bitterness of my soul, Job 7, 11. And so here's a man, the second man of the, of the illustration, having never, he died having never tasted anything good or never having a tasted of prosperity in life. Verse 26. These two men are alike in some way. In what way? He said, they lie down alike in the dust and worms cover them. Both men, the first man strong and prosperous, the second man never experiencing prosperity, both die. Their bodies return to the dust of the earth and their bodies are consumed by the worms. Look also at Job 17, 14 and 24, verse 20. And so both of these men, even the whatever they experience in life, they both finally, ultimately experience death. Verses 27 to 34, Job points out how experience itself is contrary to the teaching of his friends. Just look around. Friends are saying that the wicked, those who suffer are wicked, but it's not always true. Verse 27. Look, I know your thoughts and the schemes with which you would wrong me. It's sad that, that one friend would have to look at the other friends as wronging him. But it was with the friends of Job. Job tells his friends that he knows their thoughts. Well, Job could not read minds, but from his experience with their previous conversations or their speeches, he knew basically what they were thinking. They speak about the wicked, but he knows that they are really speaking about him. They may not always or uh, come out and, and point directly to him, but he knows that they are actually talking about him. He also says that he knows the schemes by which they would wrong him or mistreat him. Job's friends argue that the wicked suffer. His friends see Job suffering and so conclude, and often by insinuation, that Job is wicked and is being punished. They were not correct. It was not true. Verse 28, Job says, For you say, Where is the house of the prince, and where is the tent, the dwelling place of the wicked? I don't know that they ever said these words word for word. Perhaps they did and are, are not recorded for us in, in the book itself. But Job points out, he said to his friends, for you say, and then the words that follow here in verse 28. Uh, remember what was said by Bildad. There are several passages in Job 8, uh, verses 15, 22, Chapter 18, verse 14 and 21. Also, Zophar in Job 15 and 34. In both of these settings, passages, we see the two friends speaking concerning the house or the tent of the wicked. And so here, Job points out, you say, where is the house of the prince? The word prince, nobleman. And so uh, Job believes that they're talking about him. Where is the tent, the dwelling place of the wicked? Verse 29. Have you not asked those who travel the road? 
And do you not know their signs? Job said that his friends should consult those who travel the road, these wayfaring men. These are the people who have been around, so to speak. These are people anybody traveling the road would know. His friends should listen to their signs, or some versions say witness or testimony. If, if his friends bothered to ask these travelers and to hear their accounts, Job believes they would know that there are wicked people who are spared in this world. Job 21 and 30. Well, let's look at that passage. Verse 30. For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Job says that the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. Preserved, or they are spared. And so there are some wicked people in this world that are not punished in this world. And Job says that the wicked are reserved or spared for the day of doom. The wicked, he says, will be brought out on the day of wrath. That is, the wicked will be delivered. Verse 31. Who condemns his way to his face. And who repays him for what he has done? Again, looking in this world. The wicked are not always punished, Job, Job says. And sometimes, often, no one points it out. Their sin, their wickedness. No one condemns the way of the wicked to his face. No one repays the wicked in this life for the wickedness he has done, Job says. Verse 32. And yet, yet he shall be brought to the grave in a vigil kept over the tomb. The wicked will be brought to the grave at his death. Earlier, Job pointed out that the strong in this world who are prosperous die, and those who are not prosperous in this world ultimately die too. Here he says that the wicked are of that number, and they will be brought to the grave at death. There will be people, he says, that will keep a vigil or watch over his tomb. What does this mean? What does this suggest? I think it suggests that there will be a memorial. Some of the friends are, are saying that the wicked would not be remembered, yet there are wicked people who are remembered in this world. Here he says that there will be a vigil kept over the tomb. Vigil or watch. I, I think this suggests a, a memorial, some kind of memorial of the wicked man's death. There are people there to, to honor him. Sometimes people today uh, honor those who have died with a, a vigil. And so perhaps that's what he's talking about here. Verse 33. The clods of the valley shall be sweet to him. Everyone shall follow him as countless have gone before him. The clods of the valley will be sweet to the wicked. How so? He's died. He's dead. Well, the clods may refer to the soil used for his burial. So even his burial will be sweet. Job points out that the wicked are, do not always suffer in this world. Sometimes they not only prosper and are strong and prosperous in this life, but even in death, they're treated well in death too. And so the very clods are soil of the valley, being sweet to the, to the wicked. Uh, this isn't always the case. 
any more than it's always the case that the wicked always are punished. It's also not true that the wicked always prosper. But sometimes the wicked do prosper, and sometimes the wicked are punished in this world. And we know from the scriptures that all will be judged. There will be a judgment day, and all will answer for what they've done, whether good or bad, according to Paul in the New Testament. Finally, here in verse 33, the text reads, everyone will follow him. And what does he mean? Well, some have pointed out that this could be speaking of a funeral procession to the grave of the man who's died. However, based on the remainder of the passage, I, I think it's more likely a description of how all mankind, all men, will follow him in death as countless others have gone before him. So people who have died in the past, people who will die in the future, and even as he has died himself. So he says, even though in this particular example, the even death is sweet to the, the man, at least the burial is sweet to him, those who mourn him, but the second part of the passage, everyone shall follow him as countless have gone before him. So this may refer to, to the people who had the countless people who had died before him and everyone else who would follow him in death. Given the universality of, of death, it is all the more important for us to be ready for the judgment day. Are you prepared to meet the Meet the Lord. Verse 34, last verse of the chapter. How then can you comfort me with empty words, since falsehood remains in your answers? Job found no comfort in his friend's words. He calls their words empty or vain, futile. He said there were falsehood. There was falsehood in their answers, their speeches. Falsehood. They certainly were not always truthful, or their words were not always true. There was faithlessness in these answers. And in some ways, it appears that they were willing to ignore the, the experience for the sake of their tradition that the wicked suffer. Job had no confidence in their answers. Earlier, Job said how his friends dealt deceitfully in Job 6, 14 to 23. Job makes some good points here in the, in the chapter. Sometimes People die who, who are wicked. Sometimes uh, they, they suffer because they're wicked, but sometimes they prosper too. Sometimes good people suffer as well. And Job was one of those good people. We hope that this has been helpful in your understanding of Job. And we encourage you to continue to study and invite you to come back next time we have opportunity. Thank you for being here today.